העולם כולו מחכה למוצרים שלכם. אז תנו לנו במכון הייצוא לסייע לכם להצליח ברמה הבינלאומית. מכון הייצוא מעניק מדי שנה לאלפי יצואנים ישראלים מגוון שירותים וכלים להצלחה בינלאומית, בעזרת שלוש דרכים מרכזיות. המכללה לייצוא ושיווק בינלאומי מספקת כלים הכרחיים במגוון הכשרות, בהדרכת אנשי מקצוע מובילים במשק. שירותי מידע וייעוץ, החל מהצעד הראשון ועד לתחילת הפעילות אל מול שווקים ברחבי העולם. יצירת הזדמנויות עסקיות מותאמות לצרכים שלכם. פנו אלינו עוד היום, כדי שנוכל לסייע לכם בדרך לייצוא מצליח. מכון הייצוא מייצרים הזדמנויות עבורך. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, good morning to you, uh, Gary, in the USA. My name is Daphne Sternfeld. I'm the uh, uh, head of the uh, Export and International Marketing College of the Israel Export Institute. And I'm uh, very happy to host today two giants, uh, Gary Fowler, who is an award-winning Silicon Valley tech and AI veteran, and uh, will be hosted by Dr. Leon Eisen, an inventor, entrepreneur, and health tech veteran, and also a senator at World Business Angel Invested Forum, uh, who will lead the conversation. And uh, we will hear how uh, Israeli companies and our companies in general can succeed in the US market, especially uh, when we talk about the technological companies. So without further ado, I will uh, allow Dr. Leon Eisen to start the webinar. Uh, as you can see, we are recording the webinar. It will be uploaded to our website uh, uh, in the next few days, and uh, you'll be able to watch it again if you like. Uh, Leon, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you. And thank everybody who joined our webinar today. And today we will learn about how to go global and specifically how to scale up the United States with legendary entrepreneur from Silicon Valley, Gary Fowler. So good morning, Gary. Good to good see you. Good morning, Leon. It's good to see you today. It's a privilege to have you with us today. And let me just put a little bit content at who you are. You are an extraordinary, you have an extraordinary history of success in Silicon Valley. And you are an award-winning serial entrepreneur and investor with 70 companies, two unicorns, and successful IPO. You were an in originally management team of Click Software. By the way, this is Israeli company, which was sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion. Gary is co-founder of Java AI that was recently acquired by Visual. Currently, Gary is the CEO and president of GSD Venture Studios. By the way, we are very interested to know what is a GSD. One, and this is one of the leading Silicon Valley business accelerator. He helped more than 100 international companies with innovative products to establish a footprint in the United States. He podcast attracted legendary guests like Guy Kawasaki, like Steve Wozniak and Kyle Corby. So let me know if I forgot something. No, 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 I, but I appreciate the very kind words. <laughs> you know, I, I don't deserve it. I, but I'm humbled by it. Thank you, Leon. But we're just, we're out there. We want to make a little dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs said, and we want to help these companies to realize their full potential. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So we're here to learn from you what the most important factors and tips we need to know in order to scale up the United States. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's some, some hacks. One is that networking connections are extremely important because it's, it's kind of like a small club. And once you're inside that club, you know, I've been doing this for over 35 years in Silicon Valley. Imagine who you know. You know, it's, uh, I'll be there on Thursday evening. There's an event for three hours on Sand Hill Road. Those kind of events, Sand Hill Road is a place where many of the top investors are located from around the world. But you got to be inside of that network. 
having the right kind of team. They talk about a lot, the right kind of team that's positive and optimistic and believes in their dreams. You know, the soft side of it, you can have the greatest technologists in the world, but they may not become a unicorn because you've got to have the, the magic, the sales, marketing, business development magic many times. The other thing is you need to have the right legal structure, Leon. You've got to have the right structure in place that makes sense for that company. The other thing is you need to have persistence and grit, right? You need to believe in those dreams, to believe you can do it. You do have to pivot sometimes, but you know, with Eva, we pivoted three times. We started out as a Google-like search for the personal cloud, didn't work because people didn't remember their passwords. Great idea, by the way. We pivoted to AI, task assistant. Google came into the market. We took those same patents and we moved over to Eva Remote Workforce Management. And we hit it and we nailed it right at the beginning of the pandemic. Our business was up 38 times. So believing in that dream, staying positive. And, you know, it's it's never easy, but can be a lot of fun. So if you yeah. believe it and keep a positive attitude, it can be a lot of fun. Amazing. I know like a mentor at the Israel Expert Institute, I meet a lot of companies, quite successful companies who really face some challenges to penetrate into the United States. And because of, they have to know, as you said, the legal issues, you have to know how to hire people. It's not easy in the United States. There's a lot of mistakes people do in hiring people. You have to understand mentality. And very important to have some uh, track record on the subject and in the industry. And this is very important so without some pilots without some track record it's almost impossible to start business in the united states so very interesting and uh, here i would like to think about how to scale up i know that in silicon valley there is very interesting approach uh, people call it so go from family to tribe from tribe to village from village somewhere else could you just comment that what is it and how it works actually yeah, so I mean, the situation in terms of scale up. So, you know, as your company evolves, in fact, there's a very interesting book, The Owner Startup Manual by Bob Dorf and Steve Blank. And I encourage your viewers to take a look at that book because it's about customer development. And your company goes through iterations, right? So, as you get started with a company, you come up with an idea, you're not sure if it's going to work. But one of the things you want to do is you want to do your customer development. By that, I mean, and as you're scaling up, you want to go out and test your message. What we did, we did at uh, Eva, is we actually mocked up what it would look like and we go out and present it. I walked down the street in Palo Alto, California, and I would pick people out of cafes. And by the way, some of them were VPs of Apple. I mean, it was amazing who I, I saw. And I picked 50 people, my partner, David, who's a billionaire, and myself. And we picked them. We went down through and recorded them. And we listen to their comments and we use that to help us make the product better. That's really important, that feedback. So if you're going to go from a, a small company to the next level up, customer development, and more importantly, are people willing to spend money to buy your product? Take money out of their pockets. A lot of people talk. And what happened is when we did uh, the first iteration of Eva was find them. People said, oh, I understand. I can't find things. Google like search for your personal cloud, Slack. Google Drive, Dropbox, all email is credibly important. What you did, we didn't understand is that people don't remember their passwords, right? And on the other side of it, they don't want to have all their different repositories connected. They love, want it, but they don't want to do it. So doing the customer development really helps. You find out what they want. And as you grow your company up, it's going to morph. It's going to change. You go from being a, um, an entrepreneur in a startup to be in more operational managing a business. It's a different kind of mentality. By the way, not everybody likes it, Leon. They like the, yeah. the, the energy of a startup, but they don't want to be in operations or running a Fortune 500 company. Right, exactly. So at each uh, stage of development, it's very important to understand what kind of people you're going to hire, what kind of development you're going to make, what kind of sales parameters or KPIs you have to apply. Sure. Uh, that's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, and you sales, have to... marketing, business development. You know, the other thing is there's legal. One thing we got to, there's a lot of HR rules around hiring people in California, how much you pay them, 
how do you look at the amount of uh, the work, what their average day can be. Uh, you got to be very careful. Each state is different. All 50 states have different rules, by the way. So Texas is different than Florida. Florida is different than California. And you need to make sure you're complying with those rules. For instance, if somebody leaves your company, there's so many, uh, so much time before you got to get the, that, that check to them, their final check. And if you don't do it, you're in, not in compliance. So make sure that you comply with those rules. And, and you know, as you're building your company, there's a lot of different types of rules. Um, taxes need to be filed in a certain manner. If you're, if you're a Delaware corporation with an office in California, you've got double responsibility sometimes. You just have to be compliant. And if you do that, you're not going to have any problems. The challenge is if you don't do these things and due diligence is done in your company, you're going to fail. And you want to set this. It's like building a house, Leon. You want to make sure you have your foundation in place when you're building your house. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, recently I heard something like a joke for me, but it, it really is the law. So in California, in, in Silicon Valley, there is a law that your website should have some for blind people. Otherwise, you will be punished. So well, could you comment on this? I mean, the situation is, you know, the one thing we want to all do in our lives, and this is more of my, from my own personal side, but you need to make sure that you have diversity, right? And so, you know, this world, in order for us to, to succeed together, we've got to reach out with a helping hand and try to help each other. You know, there's enough bad stuff going on. So diversity is really important. I mean, we really promote female entrepreneurs. We, we help. And I'm not saying in terms of um, we're giving uh, donations or those kind of things, but we seek out people with incredible minds that can make a dent. And if we find diversity, let's say, for instance, you got a great technologist in Haifa, and at the same time, you've got a great marketing person in the United States in sales. That's a perfect team right? And at the same time, if you have a European, somebody from Europe that has done marketing and sales, and they're already there, and they're in your market, you want to build that. You want to use the contacts and network because credibility and trust are really important. And if you want to succeed, you need to make sure that you're building your company with that credibility and trust and finding those trusted resources that can help you. You know, that's where miracles happen. Yeah. I agree. And what do you think? If I am going to start to penetrate into the United States, I am going to hire a sales uh, management team and all these things around. Where is better to start? What kind of factors should I have into account to, to, to place my company in the United States? Well, so if you're going to hire the salespeople, sometimes companies, they, they hire salespeople prematurely because they don't understand the sales process. And the last thing you wanna do is hire a salesperson with nothing to sell because nobody's yeah. gonna win. They're gonna be very unhappy, right? And so my suggestion is, again, go through the customer development yourself, go down through if people are willing to buy it, then hire your salespeople, then go down through and put more money into marketing, but don't prematurely hire those people because nothing good happens with them. They're going to be frustrated. They're going to be upset. And if they're really good salespeople, they're not going to be making enough money and they're going to leave. Right. And sometimes people do mistake because they hire people from a big companies like General Electric, Philips, and these people cannot work uh, in a startup environment or small company environment. And uh, they just cannot find themselves, but they are very, very costly. And everybody lose, is losing. So it happens. All yeah, the time. Absolutely. absolutely. And that's, you know, the thing is you need people that have grit, people that are flexible and talented because as a startup life, you know, there's ups and downs of a startup. And the situation is talk about equity. One of the things you want to make sure you do is talk about the equity in a company. Sometimes people are a little, um, especially in early stage startups, they don't have an employee stock program in place. Make sure you have it because if people are working really hard for you, make sure you've got that in place for them. So if you do do an IPO, that they can take advantage of it, right? There's a lot of multimillionaires have been created 
from, from companies that have started and click software, right? It was a company that started uh, out of Haifa and came to the US and look at it, they sold the Salesforce for 1.35 billion. It was an idea, came out of the Israeli military, right? So, you know, the, it can be done. So for all the audience here, guys and ladies, you have the opportunity to make your dreams come true. But the thing is, you have to take this step forward. It's not myself, it's not Leon. It's you have to make the decision. Is it easy? No, but the thing is you have to believe in it. And then the other thing is you need to find people that you can trust that can help you build that company. And if you do that, you win. Yeah, this is very important comment because uh, what I understood without advisor, without mentor, it's almost impossible to get to the next level. And even in the low level, in the beginning, if I in foundation, I just put some not right cement or uh, not, I, I put something wrong in foundation, I will build the wrong company. And then it will hit me back if I do these mistakes. So it's very important start from legal team in the United States to understand how it works, to understand where to place the company, to understand the financial implications of any anything. And then to think, at whom to hire and how to penetrate into the market. And I, I prefer to go locally. It's something opposite what we are talking today, but I prefer to, to go locally in the United States, to choose some local place, maybe some town even, start to build connections there, use it like a pilot for MVP and then scale up from this place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you got to be integrated inside of that environment. You know, the Silicon Valley is like a closed club, really. It's it's in some ways, you know, people think it's all free and everything's possible. In reality, I mean, look at it. You have the people that have been incredibly successful, the Elon Musk of the world, the founders of LinkedIn, uh, Dorsey, uh, Twitter. I mean, you, you've got incredible people, but in some sense, it's a club. And once you get inside of that club and start to become friends with a lot of those folks, you know, you hang around Stanford, you go to the events and you get in, you need one opportunity, one time, one person to help you. I had it happen to me. We started one of the first e-commerce consulting companies and I happened to, I did it out in California. I met a guy named Pi Hong Chen and Pi Hong's net worth over, this was many, 20 years ago, net worth went up uh, $8 billion over a period of two years. Then. And he really started, this before e-commerce was prevalent. They said, Amazon's just for books. He started the first e-commerce, one of the first e-commerce software companies. And we started the, one of the first e-commerce uh, consulting companies, right? Anyhow, I became friends with them where I raised $7 million, excuse me, $6 million. And the rest is history. Look what happened. Amazon's not just for books. So the thing is, you need to find people that are already connected. He already had a hundred million dollar exit, and then he started. He was on the original team, uh, original investor in Cebu, Ufida, Sinan, China, etc. But you need to find people like that. Mentors, you're right. Mentors and advisors are critically important because they're kind of like GPS systems, Leon. They kind of guide you when you're driving. They tell you where you need to go and what you need to do, and it just helps you get there faster. Helps you do it in a better way and really helps you build that company. Yeah, and there is a, a, another angle of view on this. For example, what I learned through my uh, story and business uh, I, I did in the United States, that it's very important uh, a warm introduction. In the United States, this is a part of the culture. And uh, it, so if you have advisor, mentor, who can at the same time introduce you to people, this is the exactly archetype of advisor you are going to hire and to work with. Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, I mean, it's like that all over the world, right? You have a warm introduction. It's a, it's trust. It goes back to the trust factor. You have people that trust you and work with you. I know we're we have a um, we're in fifty one countries today around the world, and I know when we went down to Africa. Kenya, Ghana, Zambia, South Africa, Nigeria, having those warm introductions dramatically helped us out. And, you know, and the other thing is, it's good to have friends, Leon, because it's good to have people you can count on and you can work with. And so having friends out there, this is one thing about business, but also having people you can talk to, share ideas and help each other. Yeah, 
yeah i agree amazing so i'd like to to touch another another uh, issue what's the main key takeaways uh, you can share with us from crisis situations that you went through in your entrepreneurial life and what you think what kind of advice you can give us about the current economical crisis and current behavior of venture capital and customer yeah sure so i mean the situation is listen it's never as bad as people say it is and it's never as good as people say it is so that's door number one so just you have to remember that and the other thing is you know there's always opportunities so people say well you know the the valuations have gone down People aren't investing like they were. But listen, family offices are. So if you talk to family offices, think about it. You get people like some of the wealthiest families in the world have $2 trillion, right? You look at Roth, Rothschilds, Rockefellers, DuPonts. I mean, these families are incredibly wealthy. So, and many times they're limited partners in most of the venture funds. That's the other thing. So my suggestion is you got to look at it differently. And you got to get your message out. You got to write. One of the things for all the startups out there, you got to create content online. So get publications out there. Write articles once a month. Go out there and do the networking connections. Do the pitch competitions all over the world. It's really um, important. You need that visibility, especially think about this. I remember eight years ago, Leon, I was one of the early Zoom users. And I, was, I remember getting a link for Zoom. And I, I looked at it. I said, this is going to change everything everything. Here we are 400 million daily active users later on Zoom. And Eric, last time I checked was worth about $20 billion. So think about it. This was a little tiny company. And I was, I early on, I had started to use it. Now it's, he's worth $20 billion. So, it, you know, there's ups and downs and ins and outs on the entrepreneurial journey. Your thing is to stay positive. And I'm not saying, you know, um, you know, sugarcoat everything, but stay positive because guess what? Where there's a valley, there's also a peak. You got to look for it. And, you know, not everybody's cut out to lead a startup. That's for sure. Not everybody. But the thing is, if you build a team with a lot of positive energy around you, you feed off of it for one another. You help each other. And it's important to do that. And as you go down through this journey, like I said, Look for the right sales folks, the right marketing folks. The accounts, the financial parts, really important. You need to make sure your books, get a bookkeeper. Make sure your books are in order. Make sure that the accountant's doing all the filings at the right time. So, and you need people that have, if you don't understand it, find people that do have that information to help you. That'll help you. And if your company starts to really grow during the due diligence, it's going to come up. They're going to want to see documents like in story top employee stock purchase programs and if you don't have it they're going to ask why because you want those people to stay on long term so put it in place the other thing is marketing like i said you can have the best you it's like having a ferrari in your garage Leon. if you got the ferrari in the garage and nobody knows about it but you it's your ferrari if you take it out and drive it down the street and people see it okay all of a sudden you're you know you have a great ferrari leon but the most important thing is the third step is can I win Formula One? And if I want to win Formula One with my Ferrari, I need to have the right driver. I need to have the right tires. I need to have the right aerodynamics. And oh, by the way, I have to do things very, very quickly and effectively. So that teamwork, it's kind of like a symphony orchestra, needs to work in the same kind of way. And the other thing is they got to be flexible because as a startup grows, needs change, right? And if you look at it in a positive way, it's fun. Okay, thank you. It's very valuable advice. And as I understand, the mostly people think about processes because they're afraid and they don't know how to reach the goal. So they put goal somehow aside and think about processes and mostly for technical founders who came from engineering space, they like the process. And this is what I try to help my mentees how to overcome this thickness, fixedness and really think about the goal, not about the process. And process is just tactics. Google, goal uh, requires the mission and requires the strategy to build. A strategy is a set of, uh, a set of uh, solutions, you know. 
Yeah, very good. So another question, another question. Uh, what common mistakes a company could make, uh, just young companies could make? We talk about it a little bit, but could you a little bit get deeper into understanding how to overcome these mistakes and how to make it uh, possible to grow even during the um, crisis situation and uh, after the crisis just gone and this is the flourishing time to grow. Yeah, I mean, you said it. One of the points is that the companies, especially the technical founders, they have a they have a desire to always uh, over-engineer things and to make it perfect. And by the way, there is no such thing as perfection, right? It never comes. And so they spend so much money making the perfect product that they never get a chance to go out and do the sales and marketing. They forget about it, right? Because it's not in their wheelhouse. It's not what they like. So you got to but put a, a stake in the ground, figure out where you want to go and get it out to the market and see if people want to buy it. Again, the, the only thing that's going to matter is if people want to gonna buy your product or service. And if they don't want to buy it, you've engineered something for nothing. Make sure that happens. So that goes back to the same situation. The founders are the ones that need to get out of the door and go out and talk to people. So the first salespeople should be the founders. And the feedback, the customer discovery, the customer validation is really important because you may like what you have. The problem is what happens is founders start to, it's almost like um, they start to, they're so good at making each other feel good. They never think about the customers. They're so, they believe their product's the best product in the world, but in reality, they didn't develop it for customers. And I had it happen one time, just, just FYI, my entrepreneurial journey, my third startup, I thought I knew everything more than anybody else because I had made a lot of money and had a lot of fun. I was about 26 years old. So I decided I knew better and this is the way it was gonna be. And so I created a product. I put about a million dollars into this product and I didn't listen to my customers. And so once it was done, in order to redo the product, I had to tear it, you know, basically sit on it for three years. And uh, it, it took me three years to finally get the ship back in line so I could sell it sell the, the product. The point is, listen to your customers because the customers are going to dictate what kind of journey you have. You know, sometimes, you know, people like, there are rare Steve Jobs, rare situations where somebody has an idea because they're so connected. They understand what people want and need, but rarely does that happen. Very, very rarely. So um, the problem is most people think they are, right? They think they're the Steve Jobs and they know better than the customer. Go to your customers, do the discovery, make sure they want to grab it out of your hands and, and pay money for it. If you do that, the probability of success dramatically goes up. Nine out of 10 companies fail. Leon, it's not because they don't have a growth product or service. It's because they don't understand how to market that product or service to get it out there and sell it. It could be interesting. And that goes back to the Ferrari in the garage. You can have that Ferrari in your garage, but if nobody sees it, nobody gets a chance to drive in it. It's just your Ferrari. Yeah, great, great comment. You know, I, I remember, I can tell you about 100% of companies I help, uh, like mentor, like advisor, when we start to, uh, to talk to each other. And I ask them, where are you going to be in two, three years? They start to just uh, to give me some numbers. Uh, we are going to have revenue ten million dollars. We are going to uh, to be uh, in different countries. We are going to build office here. We are going to hire one hundred people. All the KPIs, but nothing about customers. All about themselves. I am going to build villa. I am going to have Ferrari. I am going to this. I am going to that. And I ask them, what about customers? So. Who will pay for all your success? Your customers will pay you for all your success. So, so let me know what in two, three years you're going to provide to your customers. Not how many customers you ha have, how many your customers improve or how much they improve their sales, their uh, production and something like this. So this is important, what I'm talking to them. 
and they don't take it immediately. It requires some time to overcome some subconscious fixedness to explain them that they are working not for themselves; they are working for their customers. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. And then to I mean that, and and the other thing is, like I said, is some the many times what happens, especially with founders with technical backgrounds they think they know more than the customers and unfortunately you know when you make when you assume something nothing good happens right you got to just check and like i said i go out i walk down the street whenever i have a new company i'll go out to california in palo alto and i'll walk down the street and i'll take my iphone i have a little stand in fact this is it right here i don't know if you can see it i have my little stand i put my iphone on it and I videotape my conversation with that potential customer. And I take that and I send it over to my engineers because I want them to hear what these potential customers have to say. And by the way, it's invaluable. They love it because they know what the customer wants and it excites them to hear a real customer talk about it. And then what happens is I finally say, and these are mock-ups, generally mock-ups. And the last question I always say is, would you buy this product or service? Based on this, would you buy the, will you buy this product or service? I want to hear what they have to say. And when I get to a point where over half of them start to say yes, I know I'm getting closer. Oh, thank you. So let's talk about your company. What do we need to know about GSD Venture Studios and how your Venture Studios could support, help uh, Israeli startups, Israeli uh, entrepreneurs to penetrate into the United States? Absolutely. So by the way, my the company is GSD. It stands for get shit done because it's not about the profit, <laughs> it's about the action. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> and, very good. <laughs> and we got that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, that was he had on butcher block paper behind his desk that says get shit done. And that's what it's all about because it's about moving forward. So what we do is we look at it. It's not about, I think the old models and acceleration are flawed. This thing about, you know, seeing how much, uh, you know, nine out of 10 companies fail. I don't believe it should ever happen like that. The situation is they don't have the contacts. They don't have the sales marketing we talked about. They haven't set their company up right. So my thing is, let's take more of a SEAL Team 6 approach to it. Instead of throwing a, using a shotgun, let's use a laser beam. Let's go down through. You need to have a contact. Last week, I was with one of the companies and uh, one of our portfolio companies, and he was talking about WhatsApp. He said, it'd be great to have a relationship with uh, WhatsApp and just in passing. And I said, well, how much would it help the company? He said, tremendously help the company. So I called up one of my friends from Meta who happens to be you know, uh, in mes the messenger group who put us in touch with the WhatsApp folks at, at Facebook, right, at Meta. One call can make a difference. So having those contacts and connections, what we do is we bring it all together. I'd say it's a 360 degree pro. We go through your sales. We take it apart. We look at it. And let's not make it like I've had companies make it sound like it's a research report. They, they put their PowerPoint presentation and it looks like you're reading a journal on multiple slides. Let's make it enchanting, as my friend Guy Kawasaki says, and exciting so people want to grab it and pull it out. Let's not make it boring. Let's make it entertaining because, oh, by the way, part of what you do as an executive is to entertain. You're an actor, right? Bring it out and excite them like Steve Jobs did. So what we do is we help put them in a 15-week process. It's a little bit different than anybody else on the market because it's not an accelerator in a traditional sense. It's a hyper accelerator. By that, I mean, it's companies generally have some traction. We have companies from zero to $150 million worth of revenue come in. A third of the companies are serial entrepreneurs. They represent 51 countries around the world. So they're from Africa, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, <clears throat> all over Europe, all over the US, even Silicon Valley, by the way. So find those companies. Let's say they're an AI company. You know, uh, you know, AI, we're in three areas primarily, AI, machine learning, deep learning, quantum computing, metaverse, web three. Now, we look at AI as a horizontal, not a vertical. It's a little bit different kind of model. So the same optimization algorithms you could use for supply chain could be used in some type of medical application. So we're looking for those companies. We, we curate them. 
not in a classroom setting in a traditional sense where it's like an MBA, but no, we're right there working with you. We want to go through the deck with you directly. We're going to give you pointers and advice. The mentors and advisors are high net worth individuals, our family offices, our VC funds, our private equity, our from corporations. They're telling you what they want to be able to invest. So, you know, it's normally you're on two sides of the relationship. You got your investors on one side and the company on the other. My thing is bring them in. A lot of these people that, that are our mentors and advisors happen to be personal friends. They're looking for deal flow. This is like keep it simple, stupid, the KISS principle, right? You know that they want deal qualified deal flow. Uh, you know the companies want to go global. Why not bring them together in a different kind of a friendly way? Anyhow, we put them through this 15 weeks. The companies come out have had incredible success. One of our companies raised $30 million. We have some of the best. The companies that come in, we have 1,000 applicants for 10 slots. These are some of the best companies on the planet Earth. We believe these companies truly have unicorn uh, potential. You know, and it's funny, Leon, because a unicorn is a mythical creature. It doesn't exist. What we do at GSD is we make it real. Now, you know, I've been doing this for over 35 years, so you can imagine who I know in Silicon Valley. So having those uh, unicorns behind us, having the success, and we're still passionate. I want to find the next better, bigger companies, the companies that have a, a sparkle in their eye and an idea that really want to take it out to the market. I want to have people that want to go beyond the boundaries, right? people that believe in their dreams. And this is a soft side, by the way, I'm a clinical psychologist too, a psychologist. So on that side of, I believe in, you know, the Pygmalion effect, the self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe in it, it can come true, you know? And so we put them through this 15 weeks, the companies have had, we have companies that have been sold inside of our accelerator. So- Amazing. How, how do you support the best companies? What are your requirements? Because this is also important for our audience to, to know, because this reflects what kind of documentation, what kind of attitude, what kind of things this company should have. It could be, as I understand, startup, but it could be well-developed company looking for to scale up. So what are you looking for in these companies to be the best at, and potential unicorn? Yeah, I, so we're looking for companies that, you know, when you look when you look in their eyes, I said the sparkle, right? The sparkle's there. The, you really, you feel it. The other thing is you want to make sure generally the companies that come to us have some revenue. So that means they have product market fit. Many times they'll dominate uh, a particular region. For instance, they'll, they'll have sales in a place like, uh, you know, in a country like Israel. They'll have some, some sales to prove that the, the product or service works. But I've had companies like um, one company came to us, they had zero sales. They molecular isolate iodine. And the company, it's just incredible. They take it from about 73 to over 90% um, effective. So you can imagine for hospitals and those kind of things. Well, that company has um, well over um, $100 million worth of contracts in less than a year. So why is it? Well, it's just having the right kind of context. They got a deal in, in um, one of the, um, in Malaysia, another deal in Brazil, and it just grows and grows and grows. But again, that's taking the Ferrari out of the garage. What we're doing is we're helping you take it out. We're taking it out and letting the neighbors see it. We're taking it out and to the uh, auto auction of Barrett-Jackson, letting Barrett-Jackson see it. We're taking it out so people understand what you have. The other thing is packaging it. And you know, the visibility, it's important. You can have that product, like I said, and nobody knows where it is or what it is, and it's still yours. Let's go out, let's write about it, let's talk about it. We have a couple of shows that we do. GST presents Silicon Valley AI and tech. Like I said, people like I, or you said, people like Guy Kawasaki, actresses from Hollywood, lead authors of Nobel, come on. Well, we you need visibility. We use that as a platform. But the thing is, the Germans have a phrase, gestalt, the sum of the parts equal the whole. All these pieces, Leon, have to work together like a symphony orchestra to create the unicorn. The problem is most of the time, one or two of the aspects, you know, the technical aspect works, um, some of the sales work, but they don't have the right marketing. They don't have the right sales. 
and they're operationally not set up to be able to grow. That's where GSD comes in. Our thing is, from our perspective, is to find the best potential companies in the world and to turn them into unicorns. Yeah, very good. So in physics, we call it coherency. So to build a coherent company, and if it's coherent, it's focused. And it could go through any obstacle without any problems. So Absolutely. yeah, it's very important, very important. And what about Israeli company? Do you have uh, any Israeli company you are working with today? So we've worked with Israeli companies before. Um, we have 121 in our portfolio. It's within our, we're in our 11th cohort today. Um, and you know, uh, I've been connected with Israel since 19 with Israeli companies since Click Software Days in 1998. So just FYI. So um, you know, the one thing. Israelis are really modest a lot of times about the technology, and they have incredible, um, just incredible technology. And we want to find more of them. We want to find them to help them. By the way, we're in Africa, we're in uh, Europe. So not only can we help in the US, but we have contacts all over the world. We're in 51 countries today. So if that company wants to go to India, uh, et cetera, we have contacts and ambassadors companies there uh, that have had uh, incredible growth and success. Yeah, so if people, a uh, company has some experience in Europe and or Africa or Asia, it, uh, it is not so much important to penetrate into the United States. It's, it's not a real track record from understanding uh, from United States uh, view. But if you have a success in the United States, you can go back to Africa, to well, Asia, a, and it will be taken into account. That's a good point. We look at Silicon Valley as a port to the rest of the world. Silicon Valley is a port. So, you know, the, the one thing is you can go from there to anywhere. And that's where the key is. Why is that? Because, so, you know, people say Silicon Valley. They talk about, well, it's not what it was. But guess what? Stanford University is there. And some of the most brilliant folks in the world uh, have gone to Stanford University associated with it. So it's a port. And you're right. You can go to Africa. You can go from Indonesia. You can go to Europe. You can go to Latin America. There's 670 million people just in Latin America. 1.4 billion people in Africa and 54 countries. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Think about it. So we use it. We're in Palo Alto base. We use Silicon Valley as the port. You're right. But at the same time, you know, you want to have those contacts. So if you want to go to Nigeria or uh, Zambia, or you want to go to uh, the UK, having the contacts really helps out. It's one more of those friendly connections. It's one more time to be able to help you. I can't tell you how many times, Leon, one phone call has changed my life, right? Because of a warm introduction, as you said. Got it. It happens all the time. And usually we, like entrepreneurs, we use the practice of visualization of success. And what's interesting, immediately in the morning, suddenly you have some phone call, you have some introductions that change your life, or change direction what you're doing. Uh, I remember once I, I was thinking and I was invited, invited to the board of African Leadership Council. And the next day I said, okay, I'm interested, but I don't have experience. The next day, I met at some conference, in some meeting, in, uh, one uh, man who spent a lot of time working in Africa, and he told me a lot of stories around it, just suddenly. So word brought me this guy to explain me what happens. So it's interesting. Now, what, not I'm looking for something. Word come to me with offering. Now we offer you and your time to use it. If you will succeed, okay, but we will give you everything. Word is abundant with everything what you want. Just take it and use it. That's right. You will it into existence, you know? You know, the one thing about it is, you know, as a, if you paint your dreams, they come true. You put it up. I know a lot of times I'll talk about my, my dreams. I'll put them up and I'll actually visualize and focus on it. And what happens? It's to, I can tell you time and time again, it's happened to me. You know, you say, well, I'd like to meet this person. All of a sudden, somebody does an introduction to that exact person that you need to help you with your startup. And it changes things. 
And the other thing is persistence, right? Putting yourself willing into existence, but you happen to go to the same event that somebody goes to, the probability of seeing them and to be able to contact them goes up. So put yourself into those situations where you want to be. Yeah, you have to move all the time. It was Absolutely. a good movie, uh, it's Day Zero with uh, Brad Pitt. And he was asked, why we are still alive? Because I am moving. I am all <laughs> the time moving. <laughs> well, that's it. Well, you know, on the other side, life gets boring if you're not moving. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, maybe we can move to another part of our convers conversation. Some maybe audience has some questions. Please ask question to Gary. It's a very good opportunity to, uh, to 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 start to build relationship with Gary, and uh, I definitely will uh, send him all names and people who are interested working with him and uh, interested in his advice and maybe help. They're very quiet today. Uh, yeah. They can okay. write uh, write questions uh, the Q and A. Oh, there's one. There's a question. Yeah, but it's in uh, gibberish. Uh, Ila, Daphne. can you write it in English, please? Uh, Daphne, could you translate? No, it's gibberish, and she she's uh, she's gonna write it in English now. Ah, okay, good. Or. Um, you can you can uh, lift your hand and uh, I can give uh, uh, an opportunity to speak to someone who uh, wants to ask question. I said uh, I'll be very happy to talk and see about your product. Yeah, sounds great. Um, there's a question from Omar Dvir. Hello, and thank you for your time. Do you have experience with companies that provide services? Absolutely. You know, I started one of the first e-commerce consulting companies myself back in the late 90s, and I built uh, offshore outsourcing companies, um, you know, all, all kinds of different services companies. Out of our portfolio today, there's probably... 20% uh, of them are services companies. Okay, more questions, guys? Any advice about going on Amazon, he asks? Well, I don't... Versus on local. So, I mean, you're just, you're just expanding your opportunity, right? It's like selling in a store versus selling in Walmart. So, I mean, the situation, if you have a local store and there's one store versus having the opportunity to take it across markets. So, I mean, you're just in dramatically increasing the market opportunity for yourself. Thank you. How, Itamar asks, how do you recommend engaging with local partners in the U.S., system integrators, et cetera? Well, so first of all, you got to figure out what kind of partner you want. For instance, I'll give you a direct um, idea. So let's say you wanted to deal with um, PwC. If you're dealing with robotic process automation, there's a person that's the, one of the top persons in that group, uh, Mike Engel. You wanna go directly to the person that can have an impact. The problem is most of the time people just start uh, dealing with the integrators and not going to the person uh, or persons that can actually help them. They waste too much time. You got to figure out who the exact contact is. What integrator do they want to go to? How big is the integrator? Do they want a mid-tier? They want a large systems integrator, right? And do they? Is it uh, artificial intelligence? Is it a uh, some other type of a service? What exactly do you have to offer? And what, and what we want to do is package it up, right? Let's find out who's the right person at the right place at the right time that could either buy your product or service. Uh, Ila is asking again, it's in order to get in local places, you must have someone local, right? You can't do, you, you can't do it from Israel only. And she's referring to like Walmart. I mean, the situation is what you want to do is you want to find out who the person you got to, again, going back, here's what I would do. I would find out what 
if on your side, which merchandiser is responsible for your product in Walmart? I would call Bentonville, Arkansas, and I would ask if it was our standpoint at GSD, the former chief operating officer of Walmart's on our board, right? I would just ask him. I mean, it would be simple. But from your standpoint, what I would do is find out who the merchandiser is that's responsible for your product and set up a time to talk to them. And most of the time, they'll do it. You're welcome. I, I would add, uh, you have to build the archetype of the champion you're looking for there. This is most yes. important, not to go to everybody and talk to them because usually you spend time and you lose because it's very difficult to find. I remember I spent three years just to find the appropriate people in Philips to talk to. I didn't know about all these tricks, how to build archetype and how to do it. Now I know it and it takes a couple of months to reach out to anybody I'm looking for. I mean, the other thing is just remember this, the rule, simple rule that'll help all of you is always call high because if you get the CEO of the company and you be, develop a relationship with him or her and they, uh, you ask them who's the person to go to, the probability of that person not responding is very low because they're going to work with you. And I've done that many, many, many times. Always call high. The problem is if you call low and then you try to go higher, it really, it's called the green stick effect. It actually, they'll stop you. So go to the highest level and let them call down. I know it takes a bit more time, but it works. And oh, by the way, that CEO, of, so that CEO of that company probably has relationships with similar companies and can help you if you develop a relationship with them. Nurture the rela nurture relationships. Figure out what you can do to help them. The other thing is when you're doing your presentation to them, show them what the ROI is. Make it so that they understand financially what kind of impact you can have in their business. And paint a picture. Remember, paint pictures with words. Very good tip. Do you recommend to give a sample? Well, first of all, if you get to the right person, and uh, absolutely. I mean, if you have the right person there and you feel that your sample is at the right level, sure. Right, it's part of the sales process. I mean, you're going out, it's like doing a pilot. You're testing it to get the food. This is part of customer discovery. Figure out what they think and use it as research. You're welcome. Hmm. Any more questions from the audience? We'd be happy to take a few more questions. You know, I, I just, you know, I want to say some things. I mean, there's a great opportunity in Israel, some of the greatest minds in the world. But, you know, I, I know the, the, uh, there's a lot of um, people that are conservative and they have incredible ideas. What you want to do is amplify it and take it out to the rest of the world. Look at, look at the companies that have been incredibly successful from Israel. They've done amazing things. But you each have those opportunities to do it if you believe in your dreams and you push yourself forward, um, I'd be happy to talk to each and every one of you about it. So you can set up some time with Leon or Jane uh, can help out. I'm happy to talk to you. Sure. I mean, the samples, You again, use it as your customer discovery. Get the feedback. Just ask them when you do the sample, can I send you something to see what you think about it? and then set up a follow-up call and get their opinion and take notes. Okay. Um, uh, sometimes a CEO does not reply as to second go lower. Now here's what I do. In those kind of situations, I actually have had a lot of luck, but what I do is I develop a relationship with their gatekeeper. The person that's their assistant, right? And the call and to be kind and nice to them, sure the CEOs don't apply. But the other thing is there's multiple ways to get to them. One is you can use things like Rocket Mail to find out their email address. Two is you can go into LinkedIn, get it, connect with them on LinkedIn, and then feel look at who they're connected to. You know, you got to do some research. If you go down lower in the food chain. What I would do is go to their, they're gonna have a chief of staff or assistant. If you go to that person, 
they have the answers to be able to help you. Try that next. And you're not really going down a lower level. You just, it's like an extension of the CEO. Are there industries that you're more familiar with and stronger engagement? So my background is technology. So I have a wide background in technology. And so it's not just one. I've dealt with many different types of technology, all kinds of areas of AI, uh, machine learning, deep learning, computer vision, uh, we started now with quantum computing, the metaverse, Web3, but everything from supply chain to med tech. I'm actually the co-founder of a company from Stanford. It's remote patient monitoring. I, we just sold a company called Eva.ai to a group in Canada, uh, Vizier. That was uh, remote workforce management, but it's really wide. And the reason it's wide is because, again, we look at technologies like artificial intelligence, a horizontal, not a vertical. So... Um, we're, we're, you know, pretty evenly distributed. Um, uh, how do you recommend engaging with local partners in the U.S. system in integrator? Well, first of all, you know, find out the person inside of those integrators that's responsible for your area. So there's got to be one group and a person. Find, connect with them on LinkedIn. Figure out what kind of things they want and they like. I like to do research on people. So I actually go to their Facebook profiles and I'll look, maybe they like sailing. And you come up with, and I like sailing too. And I like to talk about sailing, right? Or maybe they like rock climbing or motorcycles or electric bikes or whatever it is. But find out what's important to them. So you have topics for conversation. And by the way, it makes it more interesting and more fun. Um, let's see. Give us, um, we have a lot of experience, as I said, with companies that have provided services. I did everything from offshore outsourcing to uh, doing uh, algorithmic math, um, all, all kinds of different areas, actually. Let's see, what else? Questions? Yeah, so, I mean, and that is, you know, the one thing about it, it's not about the talk, it's about the action. Sometimes people talk about things so much they never do anything. So for each and every one of you, you got to get up, get out the door and start. You know, we could go through, you can go through months and months of talking about how you're going to do it without ever trying. It's not until you go out and try, you, you start to get feedback on what you could do better. Which systems integrator could be more, more interesting? Uh, look for articles that person written. If they're a systems integrator, look for articles they've written. Look for their potential customers. Develop uh, if you if they list their customers, get a relationship with that customer. Use them to give an intro to the systems integration. I mean, this is kind of like um, investigative services in some sense. You got to figure out who, how to sell to that particular customer. And it's it's fun. It's like playing chess. You can figure it's fun. You go in and figure it out. And then all of a sudden you get a deal and you're like, wow, I did it. Let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, so Jane is my chief of staff. By the way, she's Israeli. She lives in uh, Ashdod. So she's uh, she's on your um, Jane at gsdvs.com. You can reach out. We're happy to talk to you. And, uh, you know, let's go out and, and GSD together. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. And thank you very much, uh, Leon, for, uh, for this interesting talk. Uh, for, uh, for the audience, we will send you uh, tomorrow morning uh, a mail with a feedback form. We would love to hear your uh, thoughts about uh, the webinar. And uh, we hope uh, that you uh, found it uh, interesting. And we will, we will also send you the details of Jane so you will be able to contact uh, Gary if you need it. Um, so uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you in the in our next events. Once, once again, that, yeah, that sounds great. I look forward to it. and thanks to both of you. I'm humbled by the offer to be able to speak today, and to all the Israeli companies out there, I can tell you one thing: just go do it. It ain't about the talk; it's about the action. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, Daphne, for hosting us.
It was amazing conversation, amazing to deal with you and with Expert Institute, and we hope to continue with this type of webinars and to help our people to, to go global. Thank you That's very great. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Shalom. And uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Happy, happy New Year. See you all. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.